I'm going to call us back from our recess. I know that people will start making their ways back to their seats. Um, and luckily, one of the people already in the seats is Curator Hobrock, who's next up. So uh, for our next item of business, I'd like to turn it over to Curator Hobrock for the Audit, Compliance, and Ethics Committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning. The Audit, Compliance, Ethics, and, <coughs> and Ethics Committee has three information items and one action item today. First information item is the Audit Compliance Ethics Quarterly Report. University of Missouri Chief Audit and Compliance Author, Officer Michelle Perino will present the Audit Compliance and Ethics Quarterly Report. Michelle will highlight the audit and compliance work since September 2022 Board of Curators meeting, and the full report is in your packet, and she'll be available for questions. Michelle. Thank you, Curator Ho Hoberock. So I want to discuss three things with you today the status of the rolling audit plan that was approved at the June 2022 Board of Curators meeting, the audit work and investigations performed since the September 2022 Board of Curators meeting, and establishing a privacy program for the UM system. So currently on our rolling audit plan, we have 28 audits and consulting engagements and since the September 2022 Audit Compliance and Ethics Committee, we completed one audit, bringing total audit completion to four. Seven internal audits are in process. And the final fiscal year 2023 review of management action plan implementation related to former audits is underway and will be reported at the April board meeting. In addition, we completed nine investigations and are actively working seven. So the audit that we completed was related to scholarships at the <coughs> University of Missouri St. Louis. And these are monetary awards provided to students to help pay for tuition and other educational costs. The scholarship audits for all four campuses are on the rolling audit plan because of the relationship to the Strategic Compact for Achieving Excellence in Student Success. At the University of Missouri-St. Louis, there are three distinct units involved in awarding scholarships. The Office of Advancement is responsible for working with the donors in establishing the award parameters in generating the legal paperwork. And Student Financial Services either finds and awards to qualify students or awards to recipients found by the academic departments. The purpose of the audit was to validate that scholarships are awarded to recipients according to the criteria established in the agreement. And the scope was for the fiscal year 2022 annual and endowed scholarship awards activity and processes. Our audit work identified that 45% of the available scholarships were not awarded and scholarships were awarded more consistently by student financial services than by the colleges and departments. <clears throat> so advancement in student <clears throat> financial services consider scholarship processes at University of Missouri St. Louis to be centralized, but our work indicated that most scholarships are not in academic works the system used for centralizing and managing the scholarship awards. Our recommendations were to establish clear lines of accountability for the awarding process and centralize scholarship documentation and processes. The University of Missouri-St. Louis personnel and leadership were fully cooperative and management is developing the changes needed to improve the awarding process. Once a specific plan has been determined, a due date and responsibilities will be assigned. So I provided details in the Audit Compliance and Ethics Quarterly Report about progress related to the Fiscal Year 23 Compliance Plan. And I want to spend a few moments on why we are hiring a privacy officer for higher education and establishing a privacy program. In fact, we've already hired the privacy officer and she'll be starting on March 20th. 
Protecting the personal information of students, faculty, and staff is an ongoing concern for higher education institutions. And we rely on information systems to store the essential business and resource data. The security of these systems is dependent on both technical controls, which is under the purview of information security, and behavioral controls, which is privacy. The University of Missouri system has information security, and we recently uh, hired a privacy officer to partner with information security, the Office of General Counsel, and other professionals responsible for safeguarding personal information. The privacy laws continue to grow, and many of the new laws require reasonable security and enhanced cybersecurity safeguards to achieve privacy compliance. There's, there's a shift going to people, individuals own their data, not the institutions who've collected it. So this shift started with GDPR, and, and it's continuing across the United States with many privacy laws. Um, being vetted and developed. So an information security program focuses on protecting institutional data and the IT services that safeguard this data from cyber attacks and other types of unauthorized disclosure or access. The privacy program focuses on the laws, practices, and norms regarding how information is collected, used, and disclosed as well as surveillance and observation standards. And to give you a flavor, here are the most common federal data regulation laws that currently affect higher education institutions. And as I said previously, more laws are in development. So it's prudent that we maintain a holistic view of data management, which includes the overlap in data protection and privacy regulations. And I appreciate the foresight of leadership to fund this area and the ongoing support of the board. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the committee and or board? Thank you, Michelle. Um, in your packet, the University of Missouri System Reporting Hotline Annual Report is provided for you uh, for review. Does anybody have any questions pertaining to this report? Please bring them forward now. I one comment: it, uh, the hotline reporting is is up, but it's from what I understand, it's not because we believe. They're, explain that to me again, so that <laughs> I understand. Oh, you mean the actual the actual number of number? It actually it's slightly down this year. We took a dip okay. in the number of uh, employees per one hundred that are calling in, um, and we 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 also new, have a new uh, education and training manager, and she is working on now how can we over a year's time keep awareness of the hotline and the need to report, not just the hotline, but reporting through other avenues as well, and our code of conduct and the kind of environment that we want. So we hope to have like just throughout the year quick snapshots of the types of things to report, where to report, how to report, and also um, tying that to our code of conduct. It, because we create our own work culture, and if people report concerns, then we can address those. Correct. So my point is that historically they're coming up, and it's not that more things are happening that are bad or need to be reported, but there's a higher comfort level of people reporting, and so we're finding out more of what's happening out there. Yes. We are, our substantiation rate is going up, which means we're getting um, better information from those who are reporting. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. No, I think that's a great point. I think as you've built your team, you're really seeing the effects of it. Um, so I thank you. I think that's well said that's from both your parts. Any other questions? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Curator Hobrock. Uh, I would like to now ask uh, Rachel 
Dwiggins, partner from Forvis LLP, to present the fiscal year 2022 annual auditor's report and required communications, provide an overview of the NCAA agreed upon procedures report, an overview of the fiscal 2023 audit scope, services, engagement, timeline, and approach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, so you heard from internal audit. Now we're going to switch gears and focus on the external audit. Um, and that was a lot packed into that agenda. Uh, but I will go through this relatively uh, quickly, but also want to make sure we have the opportunity for any questions. Uh, so again, summarizing the results from the 2022 uh, audit, uh, the NCAA agreed upon procedures, and then a high-level overview of the 20, fiscal 23 external audit scope. So our audit approach, um, there's various standards that we have to adhere to, both from a financial reporting standpoint uh, and also auditing standards um, standpoint. And we have those listed here. And because of the level of federal funds that the system has, um, there is you know, a couple of extra sets of standards there in the government auditing standards and the uniform guidance compliance uh, regulations. So uh, our audit encompasses an audit of the financial statements of the system overall. Uh, we also do a separate audit of Capital Region Medical Center, um, all of which is for the objective of us expressing an auditor's opinion on those financial statements in conformity with uh, generally accepted accounting principles. So during our planning procedures for the fiscal 22 audit, uh, we, as a part of that process, always identify areas that um, may be deemed to have higher risks associated with those. Some of these are, every single organization has them. Some of them are unique based on industry. Um, a couple of new things uh, this past year was obviously the level of stimulus funding that was coming in both on the higher ed side as well as the healthcare side. So we did uh, do a lot of additional procedures with respect to that, um, as well as the adoption of GASB 87, which was a new lease accounting standard. Um, there were no matters to report on most of those items. We did have one audit adjustment related to uh, the HERF 3 funding, and that was really the timing of when um, some of that revenue got recognized right at fiscal year end. Uh, another area that um, we are required to communicate to you as those charged with governance are the areas of the financial statements that involve estimates. Uh, we do spend a substantial amount of our audit uh, time making sure that we are comfortable with these estimates, that we don't um, see any instances of management bias, things of that nature. So um, no items to report to you there, just again letting you know what areas <coughs> um, do involve significant estimations. On the compliance audit side, um, we've listed here the major federal programs uh, that we are required to audit, um, again, uh, with the, the objective of expressing um, an opinion on those. This audit is in its final stages. It has a due date of March 31st, so it's um, wrapping up as we speak. Um, other areas that uh, we're required to communicate to you, one, letting you know that significant accounting policies are all uh, detailed out in footnote one to the financial statements themselves. As I mentioned, GASB 87 was adopted this past year. That was a very significant uh, change in accounting standards, um, especially for uh, or an organization the size of the system. There were a lot of leases that had to be analyzed and determined how to properly account for those. Um, and so you did see in the financial statements themselves a couple of new um, line items. Basically, leases were brought onto the balance sheet as an asset and a liability. Um, and so I know management spent a significant amount of time all throughout the year gathering the data, and then uh, obviously we had to spend a significant <laughs> amount of time auditing that. Um, but everything is correctly stated as of uh, the end of the fiscal year. Um, I mentioned earlier the one audit adjustment we had, and then there are always every year um, a few, we'll call them insignificant or not overly material items that both us as the external auditors and management agree to just um, pass on. A lot of times this, those are related to timing of um, maybe when some of the investment valuations come in, things of that nature. Other deliverables in addition to the financial statement audit, as I mentioned, what, um, we are required to perform uh, what they call agreed upon procedures um, under NCAA guidelines. 
and then as well as um, the Capital Region Medical Center uh, audit and single audit. So the biggest thing that uh, external readers want to know is what is the auditor's opinion when it comes to the, the financial statements. And I'm happy to report that we did issue an unmodified opinion. That's the highest level of opinion that you can receive, meaning that the financial statements are materially correct in accordance with generally accepted accounting standards. Uh, and then we, we issue a separate report on internal control as it relates to financial reporting. I always have to caveat that. Um, and if we did have any what they call material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control over financial reporting, those would have been listed in that report, but there were none of those. So you did not see that, and that's a good thing. Uh, as far as the NCAA procedures go, Division <coughs> I are required every year, Division II every three years. So for 2022, we um, were required to perform that for both the Columbia and Kansas City campuses. So that's kind of a high-level wrap of uh, 22. Let's take a moment to look ahead to 2023, um, which we're here, right? We're, we're in February. So um, again, it's very similar uh, deliverables that we'll be issuing, the, the financial statements of both the system and, and capital region, uh, single audit under uniform guidance. And this is, uh, will be another year of just the Division I campuses. And then the year after that, we'll bring in uh, the other two campuses. So as far as timing goes, uh, we will have a pre-audit planning meeting with management uh, here coming up this spring. And then we really kick in starting in May with a lot of our interim procedures, our full risk assessment, um, and other planning uh, items from there. Um, if student financial aid is required to be tested as a major program, uh, that testing kicks in right after the fiscal year ends. So we usually try to do that in July and getting that virtually um, complete before students get back on campus. And the financial aid offices appreciate having us out of there before uh, all the students arrive. And then our final field work uh, really kicks in August, September, October um, is when we spend a significant amount of time um, here with the uh, final issuance being in October. And then usually following that is wrapping up the federal program testing as well as the NCAA procedures. Uh, same applicable framework for 23 as uh, was the case for 2022, so no changes there. Um, from a risk assessment standpoint, uh, we do, we interview uh, lots of members of management, um, both at the system level but also across campuses. We review all of the board minutes and presentations. Um, we look at the financial statements to try to determine where they might be um, susceptible to misstatement. And really, we use all of that to build kind of our framework uh, for the audit. Um, just preliminarily, these are uh, areas of the financial statements which are a, um, do have probably some higher risk associated with them. But obviously, when we go through that risk assessment process, there may be other uh, areas that are identified. There are three new accounting standards um, that come into play this year. Uh, I've listed those there. Um, two of the three I don't really think are going to have any significant impact. Uh, the final one listed there is related to subscription-based uh, information technology arrangements, so think cloud-based computing. And this standard is fairly similar to the lease standard, bringing some of those agreements onto the balance sheet as a, they call it a right-to-use asset. And a liability. So when we have our planning meeting with management here coming up at the spring, I know they're actively already working on this, but we'll um, really sit down to figure out what we think the impact will be. Uh, and this is kind of our leadership team at four of us. Um, and so you have all of our contact information uh, if, you, if you need us. And a number of us are here today and we'll be presenting at the executive session later this afternoon. So with that, any questions? Are there any questions, Rachel? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, one action item today, and that's engagement of the independent auditors and related fees for the University of Missouri. Executive Vice President <clears throat> Ryan Rapp will discuss the engagement of Forbes LLP as the independent auditors for fiscal year ending 2023. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Curator Hobrock. Um, we put the audit work out to bed every five years. In 2020, we went through that bid process, and BKD at the time, and now Forbus, 
was selected. Uh, we're seeking approval, but from the board to move forward with engaging them in the third year uh, of that. Uh, you, you can see the increases are just limited to CPI, which is what we agreed to, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Anybody from the committee or the board have a question relative to the engagement of the outside auditors? None? I have a motion and a second from the committee to engage the outside auditors. So moved. Who else is on that? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. <laughs> All those on the committee signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Any abstentions? Madam Chairman, on behalf of the Audit Compliance and Ethics Committee, I move to recommend to the full board that the Executive Vice President of Finance Operations and CFO be authorized to employ the firm Forbus LLP to provide audit service for the University of Missouri for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2023. Thank you, Curator Hobrock. A motion has been made to approve the fiscal year 2023 engagement of independent auditors and related fees as presented. Do I have a second from the board? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the Audit Compliance and Ethics Committee will need to hold an executive session later today. May I have a motion and a second from the Audit Committee to conduct a closed session meeting? So moved. Second. <coughs> motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye of the committee, please. Executive committee members. I believe needs oh, is Phyllis will do the roll call for the committee, I believe. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. For the executive, for this, okay. It's the three committee members. If you, it's uh, oh, Hobrock, Holloway, and Burnsick, if that helps you. Curator Burnsick? Yes. Curator Hobrock? Yes. Curator Holloway? Yes. All in favor? Madam Chairman, on behalf of the uh, uh, Audit Committee, uh, we recommend uh, holding an executive session later today. Great. Thank you, Curator Hobrock. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to President Choi to present the campus highlights for the Madam University. Chairman, I believe you need to vote. We don't. We don't, we don't? Do that okay. on that one. Thank you. If, not, if, it, if I'm wrong, it's not correct in my script, but I did double check that. Okay. Um, Mark, do you have anything where I need to check? Okay, make sure I'm on, on, on schedule here. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to President Choi to present the campus highlights for the University of Missouri in well, Columbia. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I want to recognize the fact that there has been three uh, earthquakes of significant magnitude in Turkey and Syria. At all four universities, we have faculty, staff, and students that hail from that country or have families in that region. Uh, our thoughts are with them, our prayers are with them, and we hope that uh, they're able to recover quickly. Thank you. Thank you. So let me begin by sharing, once again, our most exciting, the most uh, innovative investment that we're making at the University of Missouri. And the goal of Mizzou Forward is to achieve excellence in all that we do. And as a university, we're focused on student success, research excellence, as well as meaningful engagement with the communities that we serve. And we launched the Mizzou Forward quietly or softly uh, about a year ago. And now I want to provide for you some updates on the progress that we made. At the heart of this, it's an investment in faculty and staff and students. We've hired 37 faculty members that hail from some of the best universities around the country and around the world. You can see some of the faculty members here. They bring with them <coughs> very significant research grants from NIH, NSF, and other highly prestigious uh, federal agencies. Our goal is to hire about 30 more this year. But in addition to hiring the faculty members and staff that will uh, strengthen our research uh, innovation, we're also making investments in our current faculty through retention packages, investments in core facilities, as well as proposal support and the Great Books program that the provost is launching to help support those faculty members in arts, 
humanities, and social sciences. But beyond Mizzou Forward, we're also hiring faculty members on the tenure tenure track, NTT faculty, and staff members. Some of those are shown at the bottom there. The JNA Palmer comes to us uh, to the School of College of Education and Human Development from University of Wisconsin Madison. Ryan Snyder joins us from Stanford University, and he clerked with the Supreme Court uh, as part of his training. Michael Shakoin was recruited from Washington University and now heads our neurosurgery department. And Hansa McGee, her last position was, was with Arizona State University, and she's working in the Office of Research to help develop a, a more rigorous and accurate approach for data collection and data reporting, which is very important. We're also investing, investing in big ideas. Uh, we made an investment as part of the uh, Mizzou Ford Initiative to develop a material science and engineering institute that brings together faculty from several colleges, and there are over 50 faculty members that are involved in this type of project. We've already made significant investments in electron microscopy as well as other analytical instruments, and together with colleagues at three other universities, we are going to be very competitive for new investments through the CHIPS program and other economic development activities. But as part of future investments, we are going to continue with cluster hiring and more graduate and undergraduate programs in this very important area for the future. We recently held a symposium to discuss the the ability for us to delve into the next frontier. The next frontier is the brain. And there are a number of key, not only university, but also federal agency activities related to this particular area of science that brings together not only neurology, neurosciences, psychology, but engineering, analytics, but also ethics. We've already made investments in this area with uh, some of the most innovative and advanced instruments, including a 7T MRI, but we're also going to continue to make investments by developing an institute for brain science, as well as hiring and new graduate programs. Student success. Uh, let me share with you that our students are competitive at the national, international stage. What you see on this slide are a number of students that have received the National Science Foundation Graduate Fellowship. Only 2,000 are awarded each year. And you can see we have seven students that are performing at the highest level. Some of them are staying at the University of Missouri to work with our world-class faculty. Some of them are moving on. For example, Matthew Guest graduated from engineering, and he's now pursuing his PhD at Georgia Tech. We're also very proud of Paul Odu. I know it says on there he's a Rhodes Scholar finalist. My opinion, he should have received a Rhodes Scholarship. And uh, he is an outstanding student that is studying in economics and getting a degree in constitutional democracy. Those students that you see on the right, the SEC Emerging Scholars, are graduate students that are pursuing research, education, and leadership and once they graduate, they're going to take on very important positions in universities, government, and industry. As a university, student success is really key to our mission. And student success, as measured by engagement of our students, retention, and graduation rates, are what separates the four universities from other universities in the state of Missouri. And those are some of the areas like identifying and removing barriers, providing opportunities for meaningful experiences of our students, and more support for mental health and other well-being support are critically important in universities. And because we focus on these activities, we're seeing great progress. This slide shows over the past 10 years our graduation rate and how they have, how the rates have changed over the years. We've seen the highest graduation rate in our history at 75.3%, and this is highest among Missouri publics, as you can see from this graph. 
We're also seeing a high, the highest graduation rate for Pell students. But you can see that there is a difference of about difference of about 12 points when it comes to our graduation rates. We need to reduce that difference, not by lowering the overall, but increasing both, but accelerating the growth of Pell student graduation rates. When we look at our black and African American graduation rate, we've also seen our historic highs. And for Hispanic students, we hit our historic high back in 2013, but we're on our way back up to eclipsing that number. And we're very proud of the work by our faculty, staff, advisors that have focused on this very important activity, not only through strategies, but tactical ways of removing the barriers that I spoke about before. I want to share with you our progress as a university when it comes to uh, recruiting and retaining and graduating black and African American students. This is a comparison of all of the flagships that surround the University of Missouri. And if you look at this number, we're number two at 6.5%. And if we look back for the past 10 years, we have been either number one or number two for, those ten, for that 10 year period. This is due to the excellent work of recruiting and retaining the students that uh, we, we uh, bring in to the University of Missouri. So on the uh, faculty side, on the faculty side, these are for tenure, tenure track faculty, and on this list, we're number four, but very close to University of Illinois. So there's some work that we need to do, but as you can see, we are ahead of so many other universities that are, that are in our region. When we look at the next, for all faculty, we're also at number four, but also very close to University of Illinois. And so the message here is we have some work to do, but we made a lot of progress over the past 10 years at the University of Missouri. Research success. Our faculty members are the heart and soul of our university. They're the one constant that we have at the university. And as you can see from this list, whether we have faculty members like Randy Prather, who is uh, just an outstanding professor of animal sciences, becoming a member of the National Academy of Inventors, to Professor Noah Herringman, professor of English, who has received significant recognition from NEH for his excellent work. Our faculty members are not only nationally, but internationally competitive. We're also continuing to invest in our areas of strength. I talked about <coughs> Professor Rob Myers before, and Professor Myers has received, within the past six months, two grants, one for $25 million, one for $10 million. Now, the while the size of the grants from at USDA is very impressive, it's the impact that this work is going to have right here in our community. There are going to be hundreds of farming communities in this state that are going to benefit from the advanced climate, climate smart approaches to increase yield and reduce the use of water and other resources for uh, farming in this community, in the state of Missouri. We've also had a recent breakthrough by one of our faculty members, Professor Hao Jing Yang from physics, and he is part of a group of researchers that are analyzing the daily images that are coming in from the James Webb Space Telescope. And what he learned through this approach is to gain a better understanding of how the universe formed by looking at what is called the redshift of the data coming in, the imaging data. And because of the accuracy and the broad spectrum of the telescope, they're now able to have a re-envision, re-envision and a more accurate understanding of how the universe formed and when it formed. This is truly, tr truly exciting. 
So let me share with you our overall research performance. Our university is measured by the NSF HER data, which measures total research for all universities in the United States. In 2011, we ranked 88th in the country, but because of the hard work of our faculty, staff, and students, we have seen a steady increase in our growth. We are now at 71 based on the 2021 numbers, but to share with you what the trends are gonna be between 21 and 22, in 2021, our total research expenditure was 389 million. In 2022, our number is 432 million, an 11% increase in one year. So I predict that we're gonna to continue to climb this uh, upward trend when it comes to our national rankings, which goes to really signify the importance of the work that our faculty members perform. Investing in our future. I uh, want to share with you, this is no news for you because you've been on the board uh, approving the projects that we have. And during the past three years, these are some of the key innovative projects, really investments in infrastructure that really places the University of Missouri in a great position to continue its growth in research, student success, and engagement. It's highlighted by the Next Gen Center, uh, which is, which is named the Roy Blunt Next Gen Precision Health Building, and all the other investments that we're making, whether it's in nursing or agriculture or athletics. We also have $300 million of projects that are currently under construction, including the Children's Hospital, the Stevens Indoor Facility, so that our student athletes have the type of first-rate facility that they need to compete at the highest level. We're also very excited about the investment that we're making to support agriculture and veterinary medicine in this state. Future projects include uh, the electrical connection. Without it, we can't grow. Without it, we can't keep the lights on. So it's a very important project for us. The Thompson Center building. There are some other projects that are in the planning phases and will require board approval including the Engineering and Applied Sciences building and additional investments that we want to make for student success in the Ellis Library. Some other projects that are in design currently that have been approved are those that are shown there. The Murr West Extent uh, Edition will allow our Murr facility to be able to process more radioisotopes that are so important for treatment and diagnosis of very critical diseases affecting Missourians and people all over, all over the world. Developing a championship culture, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because um, our athletics director, Desiree Reed Francois, gave a really compelling report of the advances that have been made. But let me share with you, we are so proud of the work that the AD and the coaches and the entire staff and the student athletes are doing to elevate our brand as a university. And these are some of the highlights. The 52% increase in men's basketball is truly, I could feel it when I go to the game and the fans feel it as well. We're gonna to continue to make investments and we're very proud of the work being done at our athletics department at the university. Last but not least, in the, coming, in the coming year, we are going to be developing and launching a comprehensive campaign, which will be the largest in our history. And it's going to focus on our key, our key investments that are needed to move the university forward. Those are some of the campaign themes that we've identified, and we've sought input from our community as well as our donors. And we're going to be developing big ideas at each of the colleges to be able to name the colleges. And that's going to be a challenge to all of our deans so that we can have the investments that are needed for this university to continue to achieve excellence at the university. So that's my last slide. And Curator Winokur, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Anybody have any comments or questions? 
I'll ask one. Um, you were talking about the increase in graduation graduation rates. We were talking about diversity specifically, and we emphasized the faculty and the advising. I know that takes a team. Can you talk about some of the other parts of the university that contribute to that? It does take a team. Student affairs, uh, the work that's being done by Dr. Bill Stackman and his team. Also, the student success initiatives that are being led by ID and Dr. Maurice Gibson. So it does take a village, and it's something that we all care about very deeply. And uh, I want to give kudos to our advising team. You know, they have been an uh, advising team that is coordinating with the, uh, with the folks and the care team that makes sure that our students, if they are feeling stressed, if they are feeling that they need additional help, provide that support for them. I hope you'll pass on because it's a lot of coordination on a big university. So pass on our thanks to all Thank of you. them. Thank you. Dr. Um, Troy, I just want to say one thing. Uh, when the Kemper Fellows were recognized at the basketball game, uh, some of us uh, curators were in attendance. Mm -hmm. And they recognized each of the professors, uh, three in line, mm -hmm. and polite applause mm -hmm. by the assembled crowd at the basketball game. And they got to the number four, and it was Dr. Choi. Mm -hmm. And the ovation was amazing. Mm. You are well-liked on this campus, and I personally know that it's from your hard work, and you're out there among them, as we say. And I just wanted to, uh, it was gratifying for, for me to see that reception and that uh, applause that you got that day. I just want to mention to everyone, it shows the hard work of you and all your team. But thank you for working that hard and, and being accepted the way you are on this campus. Thank you. That was my family, so. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Choi, I, I would like to address graduation rates just for a moment, and, and maybe you can help me out understand two, uh, two issues. One is the Hispanic graduation rate seems to have leveled off and is dropping. Any sense as to why? Back in 2013, the number of Hispanic students was, was low. Since then, we've increased the number of Hispanic students. So any small difference, let's say, the number of students that graduate would have a big impact in, in that uh, movement of that number. But you've seen that beginning in um, like 2012, there was a decline for all of the categories that we saw, and then an increase. Back in 2012, 2013, we had so many students at the university, but not enough faculty and staff to support them. And so student to faculty ratio does matter. And so as we saw more uh, faculty members being hired and the number of students leveling off, we've seen the increase in graduation rates. And we see that the other, at the other three universities as well. Okay, and then again, on the, on the black or African-American, we. We're doing very well of increasing over the last four or five years, but now we've seen to have leveled off. Mm -hmm. uh, is that an indication that we've hit our peak, or do you think you can no. take it, get it closer to the 75%, and, and how are we going to do that? Yes, we can do that, and that's through the work of our advisors, that's through the work of the IDE program, as well as the engagement programs, such as performing undergraduate research, providing opportunities for internships. These are the, those are the types of program that increases uh, resiliency within the program for the, so that students continue with their studies. And that's why the investments that we're making in student success is going to have an impact for all demographics of students. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just offer one comment. Um, I, call, I think I texted Curator Graves after the Kinder announcement, and I would encourage you all to send out Paul Odu's speech. It was phenomenal, and it's such a great example of the amazing things yes. that students do. I, th I know I texted with you and said it was a highlight. Yeah, it was. Truly. Yeah, we're proud of him. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, President Choi. Um, there are many remarkable initiatives, as we all just heard, happening at Mizzou. The board thanks everyone today for their time and reports. For our last information item, I would like to ask if there are any items for the good and welfare of the board. Okay. Um, I'm going to offer one because it seems to be my theme. Um, I want to make a comment. It takes a team to put these meetings together from IT, facilities, MVP, the board office, Mizzou administration, MUPD, 
marketing communications, the Office of General Counsel, and more. Thank you. We know how hard you all work, as well as maintaining all your day-to-day -day responsibilities when we come together at the respective institutions. This concludes the public portion of the board meeting today. President Troy and I will be available during the press conference in a few minutes. Lunch is ready in N214 B and C for the board and their invited guests. Please stop by for food and to visit with our students and colleagues. Thank you, everyone.